good afternoon. I almost said good morning, um, everybody. Um, I'm looking out my window, and it's uh, this first rays of, of uh, light are just um, just starting to come. So it's uh, I'm, I'm I'm ready for anything here now. So um, I was laughing as uh, Anthony was giving that introduction because I'm thinking um, you're going to be listening to uh, two uh, half awake Canadians from two different cities in the U.S. So <laughs> so that'll be our our. Uh, geographic format this morning. Um, as Anthony said, the topic that I wanted to uh, talk about is cholangitis in cats. And uh, I've got a nice picture of an almost lemon yellow cat here. I think a lot of us cringe when we see these really yellow cats come in uh, through the door. And I wanted to talk about this specific syndrome, but I also um, want to talk a little bit about liver disease in cats, kind of putting cholangitis in context. And uh, later on, we'll, uh, we'll get into the specifics of one case that we've seen recently here at the university. Um, so the WSAVA uh, group that has been working over the last number of years to try and standardize the categorization of liver disease, including inflammatory liver disease in cats, um, has uh, basically come up with these three categories, and that is neutrophilic cholangitis, which can have um, histologically a form that looks very acute, almost all neutrophils, or a form that looks more chronic where it's a mixture of neutrophils and lymphocytes. And a second uh, type of cholangitis that's just called lymphocytic cholangitis, no surprise, the inflammatory infiltrate is virtually pure lymphocytic. And then um, only for people who live in much warmer climates than uh, I do, but there um, is a form of cholangitis associated with liver fluke inf infestation. I'm not going to talk about that one. Um, I've actually never seen one of those. Um, so we're going to focus on these first two. And um, I did want to just point out that this classification scheme um, excludes causes of liver inflammation that are associated with a systemic um, infectious cause like FIP or toxoplasmosis. Um, so those would uh, would not fall under this classification. All right, um, <laughs> here, here's one of my cats, uh, just um, actually sitting almost uh, beside me on the on the table, looking at my computer. And you might see her toes got cut off here, but she's a polydactyl and likes to sit there with her toes all piled up on top of each other. Um, she's reminding me to. Um, just mention this uh, lymphocytic portal hepatitis syndrome. Um, this is something that uh, was described about 15 years ago, and um, I actually was uh, involved in this, so I have to bear some responsibility. But we described this because we were finding it commonly on biopsies in a large series of, of biopsies that we studied um, uh, over a 10 year period here at the University of Minnesota. And basically, um, this is now considered to be, rather than a, a primary liver disease, this is considered to be either a histologic lesion that's associated with aging or um, the feline equivalent of nonspecific reactive hepatitis. That is um, a change in the liver that's associated with something going on in the abdomen somewhere else, uh, usually an inflammatory process in the abdomen. And, his, and there's histologic change in the liver that results from that. Same thing in the dog. You're probably familiar with the term nonspecific reactive hepatitis in the dog. In the cat, when we see this, it's um, commonly associated with mild increases in liver enzymes, but uh, any degree of icterus is extremely uncommon, although once in a while a very mild increase in bilirubin might happen. And um, except for ruling out associated intra-abdominal disease, you know, doing an ultrasound, doing other testing to look for other types of problems, uh, therapy is not, is not needed. So if you do get uh, this kind of change described on a liver biopsy, then generally you need to go on a hunt for something else in the abdomen to try and figure out what might be there. What we're going to focus on today is cholangitis, and this is uh, the term for inflammation in the biliary tract. Um, so this has replaced the term cholangitis, cholangiohepatitis complex. This is the terminology that the WSAVA working group 
um, which included both pathologists and clinicians. Um, this is the term that has been selected for cats because it most accurately describes um, the area that gets the inflammation and that is around various size ducts in the biliary tract. Now I mentioned um, uh, dogs for a moment there and I thought this might be a good review slide to just kind of take a big picture view here of liver disease in cats and liver disease in dogs and how they differ because I was trying to think of another system in the body where dogs and cats get such different diseases. Um, I don't know, maybe Sherry will um, argue this one with me in terms of kidneys, but at least um, the liver disease in cats is extremely different from what we see in dogs. So, so let's just run down this little list here and um, the cartoon at the top here reminding us that uh, cats are not small dogs, um, even though I think sometimes uh, Sometimes we forget and try to make them that way, but okay, so dogs uh, commonly get inflammatory disease of the liver parenchyma, hepatitis, right? So we recognize both idiopathic hepatitis and copper-associated hepatitis. Um, those are the two big ones there. Uh, cats don't do that very often. What they get is inflammation of the bile ducts and the bile ductules, which is the cholangitis syndrome, okay, rather than hepatitis. And when dogs get hepatitis, they most of the time just have hepatitis, whereas when cats get cholangitis, they commonly have comorbidities, especially of the pancreas and of the intestinal tract. We'll talk more about that. Um, when cats get liver disease, even inflammatory liver disease, it rarely progresses to cirrhosis, whereas that is, of course, the end result um, in many dogs with hepatitis unless they uh, unless there's a treatment intervention and because portal hypertension uh, relies on cirrhosis being present in order to get the pressure changes that are needed um, cats rarely develop portal hypertension so rack your brain and try to think about the last time you saw a cat in liver failure with ascites you're probably gonna have a hard time coming up with one and if you think you've got one, I'm going to challenge you to, to really dig in and say, did I really document that that's what it was or did I just have a presumption that I found fluid in the abdomen in this old cat and, and it had high liver enzymes and I thought it had um, cirrhosis and portal hypertension. Most of the time when cats have ascites, they have something other than liver disease. Um, so lots of possibilities there, carcinomatosis, sometimes pancreatitis, other causes of peritonitis but rarely liver disease and cirrhosis. Cats, of course, like to develop hepatic lipidosis. Um, and when they don't eat, this is a fairly routine complication that we see. Dogs don't do this. There is no equivalent syndrome of hepatic lipidosis in dogs. Dogs get fat accumulation in the liver. They get that when they get obese. And they get some fat accumulation when they uh, stop eating but they don't develop the clinical syndrome where they go off food and get yellow and all that sort of thing. So this is a, a cat issue and dogs don't have the equivalent. We do see um, with some frequency in old cats the, um, these unusual hepatic cysts that you may have encountered in a cat or two in your practice. Um, these are something that uh, typically are fairly benign in their behavior, but they can be very impressive in uh, their clinical appearance, either on palpation, they can occupy a large amount of the cranial abdomen, and on ultrasound, they're incredibly impressive because you just see this whole series of cysts occupying the, the region of the liver, sometimes a very large one accompanied by a few smaller ones, but most of the time, a bunch of cysts of variable size. And for the most part, these tend to be benign, um, but they can cause clinical signs because of the position that they occupy, the displacement of the stomach and other abdominal organs and so on. Um, and these are uh, very, very rare in, in dogs. And then on the other side of things, biliary mucoceles uh, are getting to be quite commonly recognized in dogs. And there is a description of a biliary mucosal in cat, um, but uh, I've yet to see one. Um, these are extremely rare in cats. So when you look down this